Hello everyone, welcome to our first Childhood Dementia Research webinar. Um, it's just turned eight o'clock um, and I can see people entering the webinar. Um, I think I'll probably just get started though because we've got a lot to get through this morning. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm Chris Elvish, Head of Research at Childhood Dementia Initiative. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we get started, um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the, on the various lands on which we meet today. Um, I'm joining you from Melbourne and acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, in this webinar, we're going to hear a case study of how the special access scheme was used in Australia to gain access to an experimental drug for one patient with childhood dementia caused by the Lepora disease. We will hear from the biotech company, a treating, the, the treating clinician and the mother of the patient. To ask questions, you can type them in the Q&A box at any time and we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, our first speaker is Vicky Wong. Uh, Vicky is the co-founder and vice president of Paracel, a clinical stage biotech startup based in Boston. In this role, Vicky oversees patient community outreach, drives program development, and assists with both clinical study design and general commercial management. Vicky is going to tell us about the experimental enzyme replacement therapy, VAL1221 for the over to you, Vicky. Thank you, Chris. Um, give me just a few seconds. I can start sharing my screen. Okay, can everyone? Chris, can you confirm that you can see my screen? I just want to double check before I start. Uh, no, we can't see it. Oh, hold on just a second. Go to, let's see. Start again, here we go. Uh, yes, that's, that's better. There we go. Yes. <laughs> Perfect, thank you so much. Oops. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Chris. Um, and as she said, I will be speaking today on utilizing the special access scheme um, uh, treatment of valve 1221 for a single patient with Lafora. And so just a quick company overview for those of you um, who don't know us. Paracel, we are a clinical stage biotech startup and we are focused on developing innovative biologics for the treatment of rare neuromuscular and metabolic diseases. Um, we own all of our intellectual property and development rights to our entire product pipeline as well. And our technology platform utilizes a novel antibody enzyme fusion designed to specifically degrade intracellular aggregates. Um, for today's purpose, we will be discussing our lead product, which is VAL1221, and that has been specifically designed to degrade glycogen and polyglucosin aggregates. Um, and for those of you who don't know our company history specifically, Paracel was previously um, Valerian Therapeutics, and when the opportunity arose to restart the company, a large part of that decision was the opportunity to have patient-focused leadership and patient-focused goals, um, where we could really dedicate efforts to helping patients who have historically um, been vastly underserved by current treatment options. And part of that effort um, has been utilizing the special access scheme and other compassionate use programs as it's known in other countries, which we'll talk about um, in a few minutes. So um, just a little bit of detail on VAL1221, our lead product and its mechanism of action. VAL1221 is administered systemically by intravenous infusion, and it's an antibody enzyme fusion with a unique ability to, to deliver full length protein cargo, where then it is able to degrade intracellular aggregates. And in the case of Bifora, those aggregates are called Bifora bodies. 
So our antibody enzyme fusion is comprised of two main components, the FAB antibody and also an enzyme known as acid alpha glucosidase, otherwise known as GAA. And so it's through these two components um, that we also have a dual mode of, um, of uptake. Let me move my down here. Um, so the first mode of uptake is um, cell internalization of the enzyme GAA via the N6P receptor. Um, upon cell internalization, then the receptor directs, shuttles the en enzyme directly to the lysosome. Upon entry, GA then begins its um, glycogen aggregate degradation activity. The antibody portion is the antibody portion is internalized through the ENT2 um, transporter, also known as the equilibrative nucleoside transporter. And this allows for additional glycogen clearance in the cytoplasm. And the cytoplasm is just gelatinous fluid that, that, fills, um, that fills all cells. And so what's interesting is that this EN2 transporter is highly upregulated up in post-mitotic cells, especially in cardiac muscles and skeletal muscles, um, and also in the central nervous system. And interestingly enough, in diseases where there is central nervous system pathology, such as stroke and epilepsy, we see that there is an elevation of this transporter um, in the brain and at the blood-brain barrier as well. And so it's these two components that, that, pr that provide this dual mode of, of uptake. Um, which then gives 1221 its unique targeting and treatment potential. So we have cell penetration through the antibody internalization, providing active cytoplasmic delivery. We have brain targeting, which takes advantage of disease-specific changes um, in the transporter expression. And also we have glycogen clearance through the GAA enzyme activity. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with, with Lafora, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the disease as well. Um, it is an ultra rare form of progressive myoclonic epilepsy. Its worldwide prevalence is approximately four and one million. Um, it is genetically based, so it is an autosomal recessive um, disease. And in most cases, there is a mutation in one of two genes, either the Leforin or the Malin genes. And these mutations result in the buildup of Lefora bodies. And those and they are poorly branched, poorly soluble, but hyperphosphorylated glycogen aggregates. And so the disease is hallmarked by um, recurrent seizures. Onset of symptoms typically start in late childhood, early adolescence. Um, over time, these seizures, seizures, seizures become worse um, and more progressive. And then as those seizures become worse, other clinical features also begin to show, um, which include difficulty walking, muscle spasms, and um, of course, dementia. Um, and so what we're here to talk about today specifically is the special access scheme. And under the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration, which is um, the equivalent of the United States Food and Drug Administration, they say that generally therapeutic goods must be included in the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, the ARTG, before they can be lawfully imported into, supplied in, or exported from Australia. However, they do have the special access scheme mechanism, which allows patients and physicians to access what they call unapproved treatments for a single patient on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and one of the advantages to the special access scheme is that they allow any unapproved treatment, regardless of its stage of development or whether a clinical trial has commenced. Um, there are several categories to the special access scheme. And in this case, um, our patient Angelina fit under category A, which allows immediate access for patients who are critic, who are seriously ill. And to the right of um, the slide, this is actually an, an updated form. We had used a, a previous form. Um, I think they released this form soon after uh, we had submitted uh, the the previous version, but it's it's very similar. And so what uh, 
what we were responsible for was providing all of the um, product details of 1221, um, its trade name, um, dose, strength, frequency, route of administration. And so what was the process, you know, challenges and benefits to the special access scheme? Um, I wanted to highlight first just the key players that, that were involved. And that was, of course, the family, the medical, the medical team, and then us, the biotech company. Um, all of us were really new to this to this process, the special access scheme. And so um, everyone really had to be willing and committed to pursuing this process. And um, it became clear early on that everyone was very willing and very committed and working in a really great collaborative effort. And that is what really um, expedited this process um, overall. And so the challenges going into the special access scheme, for us, it was mostly um, the unknowns, the unknowns of the Australian regular, regulatory process in general, the unknowns of the customs importation process as well, um, and then also the ethics committee approval timeline. Um, this was our first foray into the Australian regulatory system, so we really didn't know uh, what was what was to come. Um, and then, of course, drug availability, um, and that was the manufacturing timeline on on our side. And the the benefits, benefits of course. Um, are obvious, I think, for critically ill patients, just access to treatment that they otherwise would not have been able to receive. Um, and that's whether it what it is, they perhaps may be ineligible for current clinical trials. Um, but in this case, it would have been, you know, having to wait um, for a clinical trial to start. And, you know, who knows, that could take months or years to, to begin. And then from our perspective, um, also, also this was beneficial because it provided us insight into potential future development pathways in Australia. Um, so how does the special access scheme compare to other compassionate use programs? Um, as far as the formal process is, is um, regarded, it was a fairly straightforward formal process, um, which was really helpful. It was really just the category A form, um, submitting that information and then allowing Dr. McDougall and his team um, to do their end and, and submit the program to the Australian authorities. And then also in terms of customs, um, they were really, uh, they readily accepted the SAS documentation. Um, we had have come across challenges with other country customs processes where they have not uh, been as willing to accept documentation or um, wanted to impose some sort of um, importation tax and we didn't see that with Australia so that was definitely an advantage as well and then interestingly compared to the United States program which is called the expanded access program the U.S. Um, has a much longer formal process just in, ter in terms of the application, not only the application itself, but also the approval turnaround time. And the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, um, also required uh, a company to have IND approval, and that uh, stands for investigative new drug. And that is typically required um, to have an IND approval before a company can begin clinical trials. So that was very, very involved as well. And so we are now um, currently registered on clinicaltrials.gov under the intravenous valve 1221 LaFour expanded access Pro protocol known as LEAP. Um, and that is our clinical trial program if you'd like to um, look that up as well. So one of the questions I was asked was, um, actually how, what did we learn from this process and how could we potentially extend our knowledge to um, global access for other emerging therapeutics for childhood dementia in general? Um, this is a very tough question to answer because it's so broad. Um, specifically speaking for our product pipeline potential, there is the opportunity to create additional antibody fusions to target protein aggregates in in childhood dementia. Um, so there is 
there is potential there for, for future antibody fusions to be made. Um, otherwise, it really is disease and therapeutic spe specific because countries have such different regulatory processes. Um, so you really have to um, go through, jump through those hoops, I guess, and that will be different for, for every country. Um, and then also finding potential treatments for the target disease, the disease that you're trying to um, trying to find treatment for. And then of course, getting all the key players involved, um, is the patient and family willing to try an unapproved treatment? Is the physician willing to try an unapproved treatment? Is the drug company willing to participate? And do they have a availability of the drug product on hand? And how soon will that be ready? So all of these factors come into play. Um, it's a very broad question and difficult to um, simply copy and paste simply because every country's regulatory processes will be different. And then of course, depending on the drug in question and the drug company in question, you know, they may or may, may not be willing to proceed down this path. And so what are our, our future plans? Um, we are a very, very small startup, and so we will need to seek additional venture investments and partnering, and we are also seeking additional grant opportunities. Um, we've been in the throes of that for the last few months and will continue to do so. It's an incredibly tough economic climate right now, um, so hopefully something will, will go our way in the near future. And um, I think Given our positive experience with the special access scheme, I think there's also the potential to explore um, in a, a new sub company in Australia and potentially take advantage of the positive drug development infrastructure that Australia has. Um, just briefly looking into it, the government, um, I think, has is willing to provide some or partial reimbursement of, you know, clinical trials in Australia um, and their may be some grants as well that are available. So that's definitely um, interesting and we will be looking into that as well. And then seeking funding to expand uh, our product kind of pipeline for other aggregate-based diseases and childhood dementia as well. So that's it for today. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone and to the Childhood Dementia Initiative for including us in this conversation. Um, we've, what little spare time we have, I've done a little bit of um, research into your work and I'm so impressed by the progress that you guys have made and look forward to um, what your work will be in the future. And then to Dr. Ellen McDougall and the team at Liverpool Hospital, um, we can't say enough about the, um, great collaborative um, environment that you guys have provided for us. So that's been really great. So thank you for that. And then last but not least, the Marco family, Nikki and Angelina, um, we just want to thank you for your patience and for your trust in this process as well. So thank you very much. Back to you, Chris. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so moving on now, to our second speaker. Um, we have Dr. Alan McDougall, um, who trained at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney and the National Hospital for Neurology, Queen Square, London. He also gained a PhD from Sydney University. Mm -hmm. Dr. McDougall has been a staff specialist in neurology at Liverpool, Liverpool Hospital in Sydney since 1997 and head of the neurology department there since 2007. Um, Dr. McDougall is going to tell us about the challenges of obtaining this new and unregistered treatment through the special access. Over to you, Dr. McDougall. Thank you very much, Chris, and thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, I'll just make that full screen. Uh, is that working now? You can see my yes, screen? To go to this slideshow. Yep, that's it. Perfect. All good? Yeah, okay, thanks. And um, so again, thanks for asking me to speak, Chris. And um, and again, I'd like to thank Vicky and her team at Parasail and Dustin, and the, of course, the Marku family and Nikki sitting right here next to me. So we'll we'll just go through things. So um, 
just a little bit of background about Angelina. So Angelina's currently aged 19. Um, she was previously a very healthy, well young lady, an A grade student, very physically active. Um, in 2018, about the age of 14, there was the onset of, of seizures with initially eyelid flickering and unresponsiveness, then developed myoclonic jerks and then more generalized seizures. Um, the EEG brainwave test was very abnormal and I can show you that the MRI scan looked normal. Um, and given that Angelina was 14, she was initially um, investigated and the diagnosis was made at one of our children's hospitals. But at the age of 17, um, Angelina's care was transferred to the adult hospital under my care. So that's just a picture of um, Angelina's uh, EEG, which um, shows a lot of abnormal electrical activity, which um, shouldn't be seen, and that's in indicative of seizures. Um, in terms of progress, uh, initially, uh, Angelina was tried at the Children's Hospital on multiple anti-seizure medication, but unfortunately, they didn't stop all of her seizures. Um, other problems came along, so intellectual and cognitive function wasn't as good. Her grades at school were getting worse. She had emotional issues. She was more uh, emotional. Some problems with memory, and then also over time there were problems developing around speech in terms of slowing of speech and slurring of speech and then movement problems with difficulties running and difficulties walking. And obviously, you know, this was a great concern to the Children's Hospital and to the family and multiple tests were done. Um, and then a gene test confirmed Lafora disease, which as Vicky's already said, is a problem with uh, glycogen or glucose buildup in the in particularly in the central nervous system and brain, but in other organs as well. Um, and this disease, as, as we've already heard, is rare. It comes on suddenly in late childhood or adolescence with seizures followed by progressive uh, neurologic decline with impaired thinking and memory, emotional disturbance, movement problems, balance problems, speech problems, um, sometimes or often with visual impairment as well. And unfortunately, this you know, is a progressive disease which leads to uh, early death. Um, the treatment up until now really has been to treat seizures uh, with anti-seizure medications and symptomatic treatment around behaviour and, and movement. Um, there's been no specific treatment available for the disease, unfortunately. And just a little bit more background about Lafora disease. So way back in 1911, Dr. Rodriguez Lafora um, described in patients with a, this sort of illness uh, inclusion bodies, which he found in many tissues when the tissues were examined, including the brain. The disease was actually better described in 1965 by doctors Schwartz and Yanoff. Um, in 1986, a, a good test was worked out, which was a, an auxiliary skin biopsy. So that's an armpit skin biopsy, particularly looking at sweat glands, where you can see accumulation of these uh, Lafora bodies. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. In the 1990s, um, with advances in genetics, the genetic abnormality was identified and the cause identified. And as Vicky's already told us, the Lafora bodies are abnormal glycogen or sugar accumulation due to a defect in the enzymes which um, break them down, a genetic defect. And normally, this sugar or glycogen serves as a store of energy in many tissues, including the brain. But when this glycogen accumulates uh, too much, it actually damages the cells and causes cell death, and hence the, the disease symptoms that we have heard about. Um, this is a uh, microscopic picture of a sweat gland from the axillary skin biopsy. And you can see with the arrows, these little, I guess they're purpley colored bodies or dots, they shouldn't be there. They're the actual Lafora bodies. So they're the accumulation of the, the glycogen. And before we had the gene tests available, that was how the diagnosis was made by doing a skin or axillary biopsy and looking under the microscope to see these um, Lafora bodies. Okay, so back, back to Angelina. So 
In 2020, she was um, transferred to Liverpool Hospital, the adult hospital. Um, and, you know, as we've heard already, she had severe epilepsy with generalised seizures, absence seizures and myoclonic seizures, progressive decline in her uh, thinking and memory function and decline in other neurologic functions like her movement and her mobility, her speech and, and general physical function. Um, Vicky's already given us a lot of information about the VAL1221 medication. So this was developed by uh, her company and the preceding company. And as we heard, it's an antibody enzyme fusion drug. Uh, it's given via intravenous infusion. Um, so in Angelina's case, she's getting an infusion every two weeks. Um, Initially, of course, the company would have performed animal studies to show safety, tolerability and effect in animals. Um, we were very lucky in this situation in that um, the company had already done a trial in humans for a different disease. So there's another disease associated with sugar or glycogen buildup called Pompe's disease, which is different from the disease we're talking about today, and this is a muscle disease. And this medication had been tried in people with Pompe's disease. So we knew that it was safe to administer to humans. And I think this was very vital in terms of getting our a medication approved and used because I think it would have been very difficult if we'd had no human safety data. I think it would have been really probably impossible from our point of view to do that. Um, this medication, or this uh, drug therapy had been identified by Angelina's mum, Nikki, um, probably before I met Nikki and Angelina. And she'd written to the, uh, our federal uh, health minister, Mr. Greg Hunt, MP, to seek approval to use. And I'll just show you um, a reply. He forwarded that on to the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which Vicky's mentioned about. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's good just to go through the reply that came from the TGA. So you know, the first thing they said was the Australian government is committed to ensuring that Australians can access the most safe and effective medical treatments. As we've heard, medications being used in Australia must be included on the register of therapeutic goods, which is administered by the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Um, now, that's really for drugs that are widely available and have been you know, very well studied. So this medication, which is experimental was certainly not under that category um, and would require to, to get on that category would require further investigation in clinical trials. Um, however, there are times when approved and available products may not meet the needs of all patients and situations. And that's cert was certainly the case in Angelina's situation because there were no treatments that were shown to uh, have any benefit in this condition affecting the history of the condition. So there is provisions uh, in the Australian regulation, such as the Special Access Scheme or SAS, to allow doctors and patients access to, to access un, in, in inverted commas, unapproved treatments from overseas. Um, and the SAS refers to arrangements that allow health practitioners to access an unapproved therapeutic medication or good for a single patient on a case by pace patient, uh, basis. So it wouldn't be available in this situation to do a large trial of multiple patients, but for a single patient, we could potentially access uh, a, a medication or therapeutic agent. There's, and I won't bore you with the next one, but there's different pathways, um, category A, category B. I think there's also a category C, depending upon how much um, research has been done into the drug and the severity of the patient's condition. So we'll focus on the category A, which is um, how we achieve this medication. And this can be used by medical practitioners to allow immediate access for patients defined as seriously ill with a condition from which death is reasonably likely to occur with a matter of months, or from which premature death is reasonably likely to occur in the absence of early treatment. So I think that was what allowed us to get access to this medication on the SAS. Um, the next step is that the importation could be arranged by a doctor, a pharmacist, a hospital, patient, or appropriate wholesaler or importer. Um, 
they also mentioned that the importer should check whether there's any additional restrictions on the importation of the product under other Australian legislation, such as the Biosecurity Act and the Gene Technology Act. Um, that wasn't an issue for us and didn't apply, thank goodness. Um, they also mentioned in the letter from the TGA that the special access scheme is reliant on the pharmaceutical company being able to supply the product to Australia. And that's likely to depend on its stage of development and other considerations. And the TGA administers this scheme to facilitate access to the so-called unapproved medications, but it is not involved with the actual supply or the cost of the goods. So um, there is obviously a cost implication for bringing these medications into the country, both the, the cost of the medication as well as the cost of shipping uh, and then obviously administration, et cetera. Um, uh, and then just in terms of the rest of the letter, they, our pharmacy had been in contact with, uh, it was called Enable at that time, Therapeutics, and the pharmacy would need to confirm if Enable Therapeutics were able to supply the medication and whether this can be done under a compassionate access or other program and, you know, depending upon the cost. And obviously a decision to grant access to such programs would be made by the company. So there's, you know, there's a lot of um, discussion and information needs to be aware. We had a lot of help from our hospital pharmacy with the SAS application. Um, but in fact, the SAS application was probably the easiest part of this whole process. Um, you know, it, the, the drug had been used in humans, uh, it was safe, we'd been shown to be safe. Um, you know, the company were willing to work with us. We were willing to work with uh, the family, with Nikki and Angelina and the company to try and see if this would benefit Angelina. Um, so the SAS actually was the least of our um, problems in terms of doing this. There was obviously multiple correspondence back and forth about shipping, um, how it should be shipped, uh, shipping costs, storage, how it should be stored, how it should be prepared by pharmacy and administration. Um, and, you know, it is, it is a difficult, not a difficult, but there is a burden on the family and administration. The drug is administered every two weeks by intravenous infusion. So um, the, uh, Angelina and Nikki and the nurses have to come in to the hospital to our infusion centre every two weeks and stay for four or five hours. So it is a significant time burden. There's also, you know, the burden on the hospital in terms of having that infusion centre available and, and our nursing staff and supplies, et cetera. But obviously we're happy to support that as best we can. Um, hospital pharmacy was fantastic in terms of um, working as, with us with the SAS application and with um, importation, storage and um, preparation and administration of the medication. Um, but the other important thing was we needed approval, of course, to, to use this medication because this had never been used in this condition medication wasn't available in Australia. So there was a lot of discussion with um, senior colleagues at the hospital, with the doctors in charge of the infusion centre and with our hospital clinical ethics committee to make sure that, you know, we were doing the right thing and that it was uh, above board to be, to be doing this. And we were very lucky that everyone was very supportive around this, recognising that, you know, this Lafora body disease is a terrible disease and, you know, this would be potentially a benefit to, to Angelina. Um, so after all of that, Angelina received her first dose of medication in June of 2022, last year. Currently has had uh, 30 infusions, maybe 31, I have to count them up, every two weeks in the ambulatory care unit. The infusions last four or five hours. Um, they're well tolerated. We've seen no problems at all with the infusion. We've been monitoring routine blood tests and, and blood pressure and all our other parameters, and there have been no issues seen with that. So, in fact, it's been a very easy medication to administer apart from the, the time burden with no problems from our side seen. Um, now, how's Angelina gone on this? Well, you know, for one patient, it's very hard to, to prove a benefit or to prove that it doesn't work. But, you know, we... we feel that her functional capacity, such as feeding herself, her speed of walking, the speed of doing the tasks like dressing herself, et cetera, seem improved. Um, her, function, her gait is better, she can run, whereas previously 
you know, she could only walk. So we, we've certainly seen improvement there. We think that her cognitive function improved. She was more alert and she seemed to be remembering more things. So, you know, I think from those sides, we would, we, we would be very um, positive that we think that there has been benefit, but of course we can't prove that based on one patient. Unfortunately, however, seizures do remain an ongoing problem and really are still a significant issue. And Angelina's on a lot of anti-seizure medication with which you know itself can cause problems. So we see a benefit in some things, but perhaps not in the seizures would be, uh, I guess, my clinical view of this. So what have been the challenges? Well, the first step obviously is to identify which medication might be a benefit in you know, a particular condition. Um, and all of that hard work was done by Angelina's mum, Nikki, who's going to speak next. Um, so once that was identified that there was a potential medication which might be beneficial in clearing the glycogen or sugar buildup, we, we then need to work out how to do this. The other challenge, of course, is the cost of the medication. So, you know, there's a cost of shipping, there's a cost of customs, there's also a cost of the medication itself, depending upon, um, you know, what arrangements are made with various companies. Um, there were challenges in terms of shipping the medication to make sure it was not uh, damaged or degraded in its shipping in terms of temperature, storing it in our pharmacy. Also in terms of preparation, there needs to be a little bit of preparation in our pharmacy in terms of getting the medication ready each fortnight for Angelina. And then of course, there's um, challenges around administering it. So we needed a, approval from the hospital that we could do this from the ethics committee and from various other groups such as our infusion centre doctors. Um, there is of course a large burden on the patient Angelina. She has to come in for four or five hours every fortnight. Burden on um, family, uh, Nikki and the rest of the family in terms of bringing her in every fortnight. Um, there's obviously a need for hospital resources to do this. So we're only managing one patient. You know, I think it would be very difficult if there were more than one patient on this uh, therapy, but you know, it's for certainly for one person, we can accommodate that. And really, I think from our side, the special access scheme was not a barrier in getting this medication. However, it would have been a barrier if there hadn't been human trials. I think our ethics committee would not have approved that if there weren't human trials. The other challenge for a single patient, of course, is assessing the outcome and the effect of treatment. And I, that's very difficult on one patient, but I know um, I know um, Parasail are looking at um, doing more trials and Vicky's already spoken about that on larger number of patients, which I think would be beneficial. And that was the end of my, my uh, talk there. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Um, that's great. Um, so um, lastly, we, we're going to speak with uh, Nikki Marku, um, who, Thank you so much for joining us, Nikki. I know it's, it's a tricky day for you. Um, Nikki is super mum to Angelina. Uh, she also serves as the director of family support for the US-based patient organization, Chelsea's Hope Lafora Children Research Fund. Um, she's also been an incredible family advocate for CDI, um, inputting to um, many of our programs and also raising awareness through videos. One of her videos has now got over 4 million views, which has um, done incredible things for improve, um, improving awareness of childhood dementia. And she's also been featured in a recent documentary called Fighting the Rare about Lafora disease, which is an, which is an awesome documentary. I, I recommend you watching it. Um, so, um, Nikki. Um, I agree. So how did you find out about the medication and, and get the ball rolling? Um, we were doing research and they also, um, with Chelsea's Hope, um, there was a webinar where Vicky and Dustin from Parasail, now Parasail, which they were enabled, they did a, um, a webinar to tell us about that. Um, also with the researcher, Matthew Gentry, um, and they explained to us um, the benefits. So, um, so I reached out to Vicky, found some more information, and then passed that on to Dr. McDougall. Um, and also, I spoke to yourself, Chris, and said, "What can I do? How can I get approval in Australia?" And you advised me to email um, the health minister. So I did that and got a, a positive response, which was great. So 
uh, I couldn't believe it. I, you know, um, so I passed all that information on to Dr. McDougall and um, everyone worked together. We all worked as a team and found, and it all worked out, if that's the best way to put it. It's been an amazing um, effort and a lot of persistence from everybody involved. Um, and obviously this isn't possible for everybody because a lot of, a lot of stars need to align for this to happen, including probably almost the biggest problem is often having the company having drug available that they they're willing to supply. Um, so um, what, what would you say have been the hardest parts for you? Of this um, maybe putting it together, having many phone calls or emails or trying to find a way. And um, but then, yeah, when we got the green light, I think the more it was the challenge was the, the getting the drug to Australia. That was the challenge um, and very, it was very stressful. The whole time it was in the air, I was like, oh my God, please stay okay. It was very, it was quite funny, um, but um, it did get here, but that was it, the time. The time was very challenging, wait, the waiting game, because um, with Lepora disease, you know, every day counts, they progress quite quickly. Um, so we're like, hurry up, hurry up, because of course, you you know, the quicker you get it in them, the the more likely that the disease will slow down or you know not make as much damage. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was the it was the waiting. And and you've been very open about um, the fact that Angelina is has been able to access this medication. Has have you had um, a lot of families contact you and wanting to know yeah. how it's going? Yes, I've had a lot of families contact me all the time. They still contact me all the time and, you know, they want, you know, evidence. Um, but, you know, it was very hard. We never had evidence other than the um, to show that it was safe. Um, so we, you know, someone had to be first on the dance floor and, and we were. And um, I just hope other other countries can do that too for patients just like Angelina. Someone has to do it first. Um, and sometimes there isn't enough evidence, you know, um, but and if it's safe, why not give it a go? Because I think, I yeah. think it, it's worth giving it a go. You've got nothing to lose. I mean, this is, you know, a, a terminal disease, you know, they're progressing. Um, why not try and see if you can change the, their, their timeline and, and give them a better quality of life. I believe Angelina's had a better quality of life. She's still walking and talking. Um, she could have been uh, wheelchair bound or, or bed bound by now. And I think physically she is stronger. She's still very strong. Um, and I believe it is because of the infusion. So to me, she's had a better quality of life. And, and what would your advice to families be? to give it a go don't you know make those calls talk to the doctors contact your governments um, and see what you can do how you can get it in your country or you know to see if there are a drug is there if there is a drug out there so do your research contact companies or you know if uh, Chris you were a lot of help for me, I, I emailed you a lot of times, called you a lot of times to see if you think this is a good idea or do you think this could work or I, if I didn't understand it, um, uh, the process I, I called you. So that, that was, you know, that was very helpful. So educating yourself, finding out what it means and understanding it to see if, if it is a pathway for your child. Yeah, I think your, your international networking capability has been um, an amazing um, benefit um, and, and that's that's a um, credit to you um, uh, is there anything else you want to add before we move on to questions uh, stay hopeful be positive try that it doesn't hurt and um, take away what you can from from this webinar um, if there's any questions that we haven't answered that we can we can do that afterwards. Um, but I'm very thankful um, that it worked out really well um, for Ange getting the, the, the access to this, um, this treatment. Thank you to Dr. McDougall and to Vicky, many phone calls with Vicky to try and find a way um, because as I said, it was the first time. So we had to work together. So working together as a team was the most important thing, you know, finding a way because 
I, I believe there's always a solution to, to every problem. If you and you just have to try, if and if you can, and if you it works, it works. But and and thankfully it worked for us. Okay, thank you, Nikki, and thanks so much for your insight and thanks for joining us. Um, so now, if Vicky, if you wouldn't mind turning your camera on, and we'll start going through some questions. Um, so the first uh, the first question that's come up in the uh, question and answer box is from Lisa, and she asks, um, is data being collected as it would be in a formal clinical trial with standardised test validated outcome measures, etc.? Um, I, I could answer that. So yes, we are. Um, we're looking at seizure diary. We're looking at functional assessments such as uh, measures of walking speed and other functional things, um, as well as uh, cognitive assessments. So yes, we are doing that. But you know, with one patient, it's very difficult to to know how that would compare to not not being treated. So that's why you know we need larger trials, as Vicky and the company are organising. Um, there's a question, Simone, but I think that might be better for um, maybe Vicky to address after the call because it's very in, an individual um, question uh, rather than general. Um, so uh, a question from Glenn Bennett. Um, how long did it take from finding the drug, doing the paperwork to the first delivery of the drug? Good I think question. about nine months. Yeah. So I think I started talking to yeah. Vicky in about October um when i started yeah making the negotiations and then june oh, was it june no june was the first drug. oh the the first drug was that what it was or oh, finding the drug um the first infusion oh, was june yeah. 22 yeah yeah and so nine months yeah yeah so yeah so it was it was long in um i mean it feels short but when you're waiting it feels very long and you know with a lapora disease patient it does feel yeah, yeah. And I think that was a short timeline compared to um, a lot of other processes. I, I know a lot of international families had a lot longer timeline. Um, like even the US, I think they only just got approval um, this year. Um, so I feel quite fortunate that it was only nine months, even though it felt very long, but it can take a lot longer. Um, so yeah, a question from Danny. Um, if the um, Pompeii phase one, two trial and safety data was not available, um, would it have been possible to take, to do some um, additional steps and then go through the um, special access scheme? Can I answer that? Yes, um, I look, I think that would have been uh, very difficult and, and practically impossible in that situation. Um, I don't think that the special access scheme would necessarily been a problem, but our hospital and our ethics committee would not have approved the use of a medication that hadn't been shown to be safe in humans. So I think it would we, we couldn't have done that unless there was already human safety data available. We're, we're not in a position to do um, what's called a phase one or phase two trial looking at safety and tolerability of a medication, a new medication that wouldn't have been possible. We would have needed that data first before we could have administered it. Um, uh, Rose Mooney asks, um, what's the first step if you're interested in finding the medication that, that your child might, might be able to access? Contact whoever it is that you've, you've found that information. Email them, contact them, call them, get advice of someone who understands the data um, or, you know, or someone in the medical field like me, and I spoke to you, Chris, <laughs> and I spoke to Dr. Majeel. So how do you um, find the drug? How do you even talk know to everyone. Oh, um, well, because we had the webinar. Um, so our um, Lafora disease researchers and experts told us about it. And because it was in the pipeline beforehand, um, and then, of course, uh, Vicky said that um, the company uh, went down and they took over the assets. Um, and that, and we knew about that. So that was um, public knowledge that we had known about. Um, and who fills in the SAS form? Uh, our pharmacists were very helpful in doing that. 
but uh, it, it, the actual form is not that complicated. I mean, I, I, the doctor could have filled that in, but we had great help from our head pharmacist at the hospital. Yeah, from what I hear, the SS, SAS form isn't isn't that difficult. It's all the other logistics around it that um, take up more yeah. effort. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I should say that it, apparently patients and family can also fill in an SAS form, apparently, looking at the legislation. I've, this is my first experience with, with using SAS, so I'm not an expert, but just reading um, the legislation, I think... Uh, there's a wide range of people who could do that, um, Chris, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, to Vicky and Alan, how much time did it pass till you saw any improvement in Angelina? Well, it's a very good question. Um, I think there was like slow continual improvement, you know, after maybe after a, a few months, after maybe six to eight weeks, we might have started to see some benefit in, in my view. But again, with a, a, a patient of one, number of one for a trial, it's very difficult to say that, but that would just be my personal view. Um, yeah. Nikki, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think so. That sounds about right. We, we saw in about six to eight weeks that, you know, every time she had the infusion, she was a bit more, she was quicker uh, or she, she showed an ability that she hadn't done for a while, which was great to see. Just trying to, there's uh, so many um, questions coming in the chat now. I'm trying to pick, um, uh, I think we've got time for about one more. Um, there's, there's a few questions coming in um, specific, about specific countries um, being able to access this. So I think I might pass those on to Vicky after the meeting and you can answer those ones um, individually and we can circulate those answers. Um, Uh, I guess um, there's been quite a few questions about who pays for what. Um, so um, I guess it's very it's different would be different in in each each case. Um, but I don't know if anyone wants to um, answer that in a general sense. Well. I suppose I can answer that. Some it depends on your country. Sometimes governments can have grants that you can um, to help fund it, um, or you can just do crowdfunding yourself. Um, so I did some crowdfunding to help um, with the with the cost. But yes, it's sort of more on um, depending. It all every scenario is different, but in my case, it was dependent on the cost that I could provide to help. And, and also the, the hospital covers the costs of the yes. treatment. Yeah. yeah, so in Australia, the hospital um, care is covered by uh, by the government. So there's no cost to Angelina or Nikki in terms of the hospital side. It was the supply of the medication was the cost. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry to those people whose questions we haven't got to, but um, we will address them after. Um, thank you so much for all of your Great questions. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for joining us today. Um, uh, what else? Um, feel free to email me. My email address is on the slide there if you have any further questions or comments. Um, you can also scan the QR code there um, for several opportunities to get involved in childhood dementia research. Um, the next webinar is planned for the 31st of October, which will be about the use of organoid models for childhood dementia. Um, we'll send out the details soon. Um, you'll receive a link to a survey by email. We would be grateful if you could be, give us some feedback on this webinar. Um, and finally, a shameless plug for a couple of events, events we have coming up. Uh, 20th of September is Childhood Dementia Day, and we're asking mm -hmm. people to paint their faces, make it colourful and share it on social media. You can see more information about that on our web website. Um, and also we have a trek coming up in November mm. if anyone would like to get involved in that. Wow. Um, mm. Thank you all for your time. Thanks so much to our speakers today. 
so great to have you here and um, taking part in our in our first uh, research webinar. Um, thank you all, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.